welcome everyone. Thank you for being here for Nirali Shah's talk, um, Activism of Beauty, Paradox and Mystery. It is my really, really true deep honor to introduce Nirali. Um, Nirali has been a, a support to Eastpoint for a long time and the first time that I met her, I was a participant for the Fierce Vulnerability um, workshop that she's a co-founder of. Nirali is both a, a spiritual teacher and an activist and just a beautiful being. Um, in terms of uh, her teachings, she's teaching uh, the tantric lineage of um, the, the feminine mystery school of the Himalayas. And uh, she's been also teaching at Spirit Rock East Bay Meditation Center, um, which are local meditation um, places that are quite, um, quite beautiful. And uh, also to places like Google and Stanford. She's been bringing her spirituality to um, a lot of activist spaces and supporting the work of, uh, of um, many, many groups, including East Point. And uh, she has taught all over the world. And uh, in her late 20s, Nirali was, uh, was uh, serving at the Gandhi Ashram in one of the biggest slums in Asia um, and just learning a lot about nonviolence. So it's really, really a deep honor to introduce her. As a young activist, I draw a lot of my inspiration from her. I continue following her and I hope that her words today will bring you a lot of, um, a lot of uh, food for thought, um, food for the heart as well. And yeah, on these words, I'm just gonna leave the floor to you, Nirali. Thank you. Thank you, Astrid. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Kazu. And uh, thank you, all of you, for offering your precious presence to this space. It means a lot to be sharing and connecting with you here. And I see some familiar faces, and I especially see a lot of my elders, Joanna Macy, Linda Hess, and many others. And I just want to I mean, a part of me is like, why am I even talking? They should be talking. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, yeah, really grateful for these teachers and mentors to also be here. And each one of you, um, yeah. I want to start with also calling in Kazu. He's not here, but uh, he's probably middle on the road somewhere in Seattle. Um, so just a very quick introduction to myself is uh, I have uh, lived three fourths of my life in India. So in many ways, I'm an immigrant in this country. And I'm in California currently, for those of you who are tuning in from other places. And uh, I go by she, her, and I'm sitting on the native land of the Huchuan people. And I wanna really start this talk by acknowledging uh, this land and the people of the First Nation and also their culture. So uh, a lot of us are probably spending a lot of time on the computer and all sorts of things. So I thought it'd be nice just to take maybe a few seconds so that we can feel more embodied because this talk is going to hopefully take you into that embodied experience. So maybe if you want to just move, open your chest center, whatever you feel like doing, please be in choice. So oftentimes, there's a lot of energy because of the computer that gets stuck behind the neck. So if you want to just feel into that energy and like push that down towards your sacrum, deepen your breath. Feel this beautiful body, which is so connected to Mother Earth.
Thank you. <clears throat> so I thought of doing something weird because this talk is a lot about being weird and strange. And <laughs> uh, I thought it'd be nice uh, if people want to unmute themselves and just say some words in either their native language. Uh, I come from a part of India, which is called Gujarat. I'll say something in my language. And uh, you can either say in your native language or some language that really has a deeper resonance or something, some word that has a resonance for you. So something that invites us into community as well as into the sacred, whatever sacred you feel. Right, so I'm going to start with saying Kemcho, Majama. <laughs> Weaving. Thank you so much. That was so delicious to the ears. <laughs> Thank you. So, as you might have read in the intro. I'm back. Uh, so part of what we are going to be doing is to invite and enjoy messiness. So all these technical things are most welcome. <laughs> technical challenges. Um, so, so as you might have read in the introduction of this talk, what we are going to explore is this topic of beauty, paradox, and mystery in activism. And we are going to explore how beauty is a power and an otherworldly, sometimes an otherworldly form of power. And many times when we talk about beauty, it often gets relegated as something soft or inferior in a way that it is losing it. It sounds as if it's uh, uh, anemic or feeble or weak and okay maybe Astrid you might want to mute folks because <laughs> I have a brain that can't multitask too well thank you um, so many times beauty might be uh, misunderstood as a soft feeble weak well as, uh, well as soft is actually one of the important qualities of beauty. And um, in some sense, I'm using this word as a feminine force. And when I use the word feminine, I'm not talking about feminine bodies uh, because this feminine principle I feel is alive in all humans. Uh, and at the same time, it, there is this feminine principle, uh, I, though it functions in all genders uh, across the spectrum, I also want to say that the feminist, feminine principle is not in contention or opposition with of the masculine principle. It is not uh, some sort of a epistemological progression theory. It is not uh, something where we are saying this is better. But at the same time, what I do want to bring in into, into this talk is that we live in a society that is built on hyper masculinized imbalance. And so to make room and space for this form of uh, activism, uh, feels important and it feels important in all spheres of life. So just want to make sure that we are on the same page around that. So 
I want to start with uh, just sharing a little bit of vulnerability is that when I was uh, preparing this conversation, this talk and um, a few years, I mean, a few days ago, a years ago too, actually, <laughs> but a few days ago, um, and I was writing and I felt these waves of shame and fear pass through me. And I tried to slow down and really be with what was happening. And I realized that this shame or fear was not just mine. It felt really old, hundreds and hundreds of years old. And I realized that bringing forth a conversation, a topic like this, like some of the fear or shame that I felt was around being uh, misunderstood or uh, vilified or persecuted or punished. I felt like I need to be careful and behave myself. Uh, and it was important and interesting to notice that and I could see how and why this particular force, this particular paradigm has not fully manifested in our world and in our activist spaces because throughout history uh, people of all genders, but especially women, have been burned, raped, vilified, persecuted, ostracized for bringing this conversation in the foreground. And so in some sense, it felt even more important to speak through the voice of my ancestors and of all the women. And I know that there is a cost to pay to have these conversations. And I just say this because this is part of the whole process that I'm inviting us into. So, I also say this because I know that the energy of beauty, eros, the sacred mystery is dangerous. It is threatening to the dominant uh, powers to be. And it has a capacity to make our work of transformation that we are trying to do in different forms. We are all trying, at least a lot of you that I know here are engaged in some form of bringing transformation in our culture, in our society. And I know that these forces can make that possibility of transformation irresistible and unstoppable. That is my strong opinion. And I feel drawn to it for that reason. So, as I'm inviting you into this talk, um, I, will, I will personally, and maybe some of you will as well, touch into some very raw and tender spaces within yourself. And the invitation is to go into the underworld of our psyche and it is demanding and messy work to touch into the visceral energetic fields laying in our earth bodies and in the earth itself. And so in some sense, it's inviting us into taking some form of risk together and I also invite you to be very tender with yourselves 
and also lean into exquisite slowness. Really allow yourself to lean into exquisite slowness because that might support us in this work. So this topic was, this talk was planned about a month ago, uh, more than a month ago, and a lot has happened and that I'm aware of in these last few weeks with the pandemic and the uprising in the US against the state-sponsored police brutality towards black community. So we are in a very compelling moment in history the recent murders of Breonna Taylor, Ahmad Amari, and George Floyd, all happening in quick succession, has somehow ripped off this veneer of stability or equity that for many white people in this country who seem to be living in a deep slumber for the last three or 400 years. And while the protests were at times chaotic and messy, I'm really grateful for them because as some of my elders and teachers have been saying, uh, they haven't seen this level of consciousness rising in a, probably the last four or five decades. And, and it's not enough. And yet it's very important. And for me personally, this chaos and outrage is a necessary moment into beauty. Uh, some of the most important teachings that I have been inspired by around this topic come from the feminine lineages of Tantra from the Himalayas in India. And uh, when we talk about the goddess of beauty, uh, we talk about the spectrum of goddesses that, that make her. And on one end of that spectrum is Eros, and on another end, uh, so that's Kameshwari, and on another end of that spectrum is Kali. And so Kameshwari stands for Eros, and Kali stands for chaotic disruption. And it completely makes sense to want that energy of Kali, that outrage, to, to really come forth in this process. As a result, uh, for me, this chaos and outrage is more beautiful and coherent compared to the numbness and chilling apathy of white people in this country for the last few hundred years. That violence is much more. That violence of silence and apathy is much more than what we have seen even in the looting, even in all the forms of chaos, in all the forms of disorganization. In fact, the looting and the smashing of property, uh, though it may not necessarily something, I mean, I'm not encouraging it, and it's not something that necessarily resonates with my ethic, but it, in comparison, is extraordinarily sober compared to the brutal and violent uh, silence about systemic uh, oppression and exploitation. Um, and in so many ways, when I think about also the looting, I really think about how a few people are putting their life in danger for a few hundred dollars worth of things and how that is infinitesimally small compared to the millions of dollars being looted in corporate and polit co corporate America and in the polit polit political system. So it's like, on a daily basis, the level of looting that a corporate head or an executive is involved in is at least a thousand times more than 
anything that any people on the streets are doing. And I feel that's, the, that's where the conversation and the narrative needs to shift. And of course, not to, uh, not to forget the level of uh, violence of the police towards the many, many thousands of nonviolent protesters. So I just want to name all this because sometimes when we talk about beauty and all these things, we might get very sugary and saccharine and uh, forget that this chaos is actually so much more coherent and beautiful and necessary because there is a stuck energy for hundreds of years that has gotten solidified, crystallized, and you can't just dissolve it. Sometimes you need to like shake it up. So, and until you shake it up, that energy cannot move towards beauty or coherence. So, <clears throat> I'm just going to see where I want to go with this because there are so many places we can enter this. Um, in this talk, I also want to explore the Western dominant form of activism which in my experience feels uh, distinctly different from the form of activism uh, that I have experienced in other countries and specifically the earth-based indigenous forms of activism. So while I really appreciate the form of activism that is going on and I've been, you know, playing a very small role in that too, but at the same time, it's important to understand what are the things that are working and what are the things that we need to also bring in to this work. So when I think about the history that uh, I have experienced as a person who came from a colonized country, and I have spent a lot of years like really feeling into what that has, what impact that has had on my bones, you know, on my, on my body. Over time, I began to see that for white people to colonize a country, they had to first colonize themselves. They had to destroy their relationship with their own land, with their own earth. They had to uh, desecrate their own relationships with their earth body. They had to kill the eros, the magic, the mystery, and make their hearts more sterile, dry, barren, in order to go out and Expand, expand and exude the level of cruelty that followed that process. So what I feel is that Western paradigm needs to be also questioned in the way we engage in activism. And at some point, as we keep moving forward in the stock, I'm going to come back to this point. Well, some people would say that bringing in the sacred and singing songs and uh, all of that is nice and sweet little thing to do in activism. Uh, and I'm now particularly talking about some of the climate change protests that I've been more involved in in the last few uh, months and years. And so when I think about that, I begin to wonder because 
the first thing that the colonizer did when they came to countries like mine, the first thing they did was they took, took away our culture. They took away our songs. They, they burnt our books. They took away our ritual practices. Uh, I've been reading, and this is something that keeps coming up around how they, how even yoga that now is so popular in the West was banned in India. So they, they took away everything that fortified us, that gave us this sense of uh, uh, feeling uh, nourished. And as a result, uh, when they take that away, you become too dry and you don't have energy to really, really sort of uh, resist. And so I feel that bringing in and reclaiming these forms of our, like bringing in our culture and our songs and dances and all of that in the activism field is an extraordinarily powerful form of reclamation. Um, so before we go forward, I want to share uh, a little piece that I wrote recently on what I mean when I keep using the word beauty in this talk. Um, so I'm going to read out something um, for a few minutes. So beauty is clearly not the corporate standardized idea of beauty that we've been brainwashed to think. Uh, so it might be helpful to explain that beauty is a process. It is a power. It is Shakti, a force, a function of expression. The word in Sanskrit language, uh, which is one of the root languages in India, is saundarya, and it would literally be beautiness. Beauty synthesizes from the higher states of consciousness into the mundane states of consciousness. The movement that it impels and the synthesis of action that it creates is very important. So let's talk about outer beauty for a second. We have different reasons for finding something beautiful and I'm sure all of those reasons are valid. If you look at the etymology of beauty in some of the, that comes from some of the ancient Roman and Greek cultures, actually the definition is really good. Beauty is when everything finds its place. Everything has order. It fits together. It's a great definition actually, and it connects with the definition of dharma. So when we break down and deconstruct everything into energy, we experience that many times we go into certain spaces or into certain groups of people, and we experience uh, either maybe a form of some sort of uh, you know, distortion or dis-ease, or fragmentation, uh, we feel tired and depleted. And in some other spaces or circles or people we hang out with, we might feel a certain kind of smoothness. You know, there's a, a sort of a sense of feeling more coherent, unified, collected, gathered. Beauty is this coherence of energy. Beauty is something reflecting a harmonious energy. So imagine looking at a face that is in uh, trauma or cruel, and you don't feel like you just wanna keep looking at it because it feels incoherent and fragmented. You feel like you're doing a lot of extra work. You feel heavier. You feel like you're carrying weight when you're when you're just watching someone who's being very cruel or uh, traumatized. But when you see a face that is in harmony, not fragmented, 
this is a beautiful face, a face you want to look at, then if there is an expression of love, it is extraordinary. So I want to actually share uh, one such person that I found so, so beautiful. So this is, uh, let me see how to do this. So what I'm going to share with you is one of my dear, dear mentors and teachers when I was in India working in the slum community. And this is Kanti Kaka. And Kanti Patel was a freedom fighter. So he had been in prison and taken a lot of beatings. And he was uh, also one of the greatest sculptors of our countries of her country and he also had um, spent a lot of time with Gandhi and Vinoba Bhave. And so I had this experience uh, that I would be, maybe you can see my screen. Can you? So I had this experience of uh, many times feeling like overwhelmed and maybe tired and traumatized and incoherent. And uh, I would go to him and I would hang out with him. And just being in his field, in his presence, brought so much resolution. It didn't matter what we even spoke about. But just being around him in the coherent field of energy that he exuded, it brought so much sense of ease and clarity in me immediately. And so it has a lot to do with the kind of life he lived. Um, one ancient philosopher said, this is the spirit that beauty must ever induce. Wonderment, a delicious trouble, longing and love and a trembling that all is delight. In order to experience beauty, we have to get outside ourselves. Otherwise, we try to possess or understand or conceptualize it. It is not to be possessed, even ornamented, but to understand the dynamics of action propelled by wholeness between the subject and object. Something in us has to die to experience beauty. And so there's a deep relationship with sacrifice and beauty. It is also a living, magnetizing force. For example, it is one of the reasons that drew me uh, to the activism of the Red Rebels. So that's one of the places where I found myself uh, showing up and because when a group of red rebels takes on to the streets there is this other worldliness to that it invites people into uh, it invites people into this uplifted energetic field it disrupts the stuck energy that is stagnating in the sterile de-eroticized hard rigid structures of the banks, streets, government offices that we occupy. It completely stuns the mind into stillness. When we are in contact with true beauty, it stuns us. Something ungrips. The grip of the mind, the grip of the hyper-individualism, the self-obsession, it creates a gap in the stream of consciousness into the possibility of something other. It makes people fall in the space in between, into the liminal. Beauty in this sense is sustainable, a catalyst to remember and the constant reminder that we are not this incomplete or fragmented. We are whole. Wholeness is literally power. As activists, we need power. The only way to have power is to be it. And beauty sustains it. 
because it is bound to create actions that take us towards wholeness. Cruelty is not sustainable, though there are no shortage of examples of that, though, though in the longer run, the poverty, war, racism, cruelty, abuse, it, 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 there are no, no dearth of examples of that, but it depletes us. And no wonder we are facing a very strong possibility of a global collapse and the end of our species on this planet. The feminine quality of receptivity is to receive something and then give birth from what is received. To receive and then to create. Beauty is in a dynamic form because beauty is always moving, always changing. And in that sense, it becomes rhythmic. Taking, receiving. Birthing, destroying. Kameshwari, Kali. <laughs> A way to think about this is that beauty takes us in with her centripetal force and throws us out with her centrifugal force. Appear, disappear. Moving from disunity to unity. Beauty is a reflection of the underlying unity that expresses the totality of our interdependence. And in this way, life needs beauty and beauty expresses itself through life. It's like they give birth to each other. Beauty is the reason for life and life or existence then becomes the reason for beauty. And this beauty is sustainable. So, just taking a moment to feel into that. And then we begin to see how does this connect to the work that we are doing in the world. So I want to just share my screen with you and uh, see if I can explain this from a slightly different lens or angle as well. Um, let me see if I can do this. So just want to start with sharing some images with you here of some of, this was a, a Chris uh, shared this with me. This was a huge mural that was painted in San Francisco not too long ago, taking, on, taking over the streets. And these are the red rebels just sort of entering into this mundane everyday life and like really bringing that otherworldliness and inviting people into something. So I just wanna shift gears now and share a little bit about how I'm connecting this even more to activism. So there are many days in my life when I wake up and I find myself in this vast field where there are all these sort of challenges and extraordinary crises erupting all over the place. Like there's one day, uh, you know, there are the murders and uh, there's the pandemic and then there are like millions of migrants in India who are walking on the streets without any food. And there is the uh, refugee crisis where people from El Salvador, Guatemala. And so all this is like continuously happening. So just imagine yourself in this field and, and like how your own lives, I'm, I'm sure there are many of you who feel yourself here. And so you begin to like, see how do you engage with this? I'm 
there were refugees and the children in caves, uh, in the cages. These are the Indian migrants. And so I often find myself like trying to really respond and firefight and do whatever I can do to engage with this. So for a lot of people, what they do, I mean, there are these, some of these responses. For some people, they go back to sleep because they don't think it's theirs to even have to uh, engage with. For some people, they are half awake and they are collapsing in the overwhelm. For some people, they are half awake and they are also trying to somehow manage this through some forms of addictions, uh, distractions that can induce some level of numbness. For some people, they are jumping too quickly into the fixing and solving. And for some people, they are, they are actively engaging in othering that this is the problem and a lot of their energy goes in, in uh, sort of shifting blame. Uh, so the question to ask is, am I serious about what it means to fully show up in these times for the world? Or do I choose to live half asleep for the rest of my life? And for me, this is a very poignant question because I also find myself sometimes in this list. And the question is, how do I respond with the coherence of energy and my full life force? How do I really show up for life? And so, there are some people who do not feel, so there, I'm, I'm talking about largely two groups of people. There are some people who do not feel, who are probably actively engaging in exploiting a problem. There are some people who are just living a bourgeois life and you know, they're not concerned. There are some people who are responding with apathy, so not really responding. And there are some people who are engaging in charity, they're do-gooders, there are activists, healers, meditation teachers, uh, people who are spreading messages and news and fixers and solvers. So these are just broad categories and I wanna thank my friend Naveen Vasudevan for helping me with this part because I also find myself in this group. And I also see that there are extraordinary shadows that I need to engage with if I'm going to be in any of these groups. Every one of these is really like every one of these actions or responses is not complete in so many ways and yet very necessary. I'm reminded of Chris who once was talking about Gandhi's teachings on constructive uh, programs and Satyagraha and how we feel that we are doing constructive actions but we do not realize the delusion in those constructive actions. I have spent so many years working in a slum community uh, and I was also actively engaged in uh, like some of like trying to bring funding into that work. And uh, one thing I realized at some point doing that work was that there were about 200,000 people in that community. And after several years, I learned that one of the main funders of that community was Adani Industries. And Adani was directly responsible for the displacement and the extraordinary amount of ecological and cultural destruction of of the country and the and some of these communities. 
uh, also some of the government people who were involved, I mean, it was like really part of a fascist system. So while thousands of children were being fed on a daily basis in that work, uh, the very system that we were trying to change was the very system that was perpetuating the problem. When I talk about my own self uh, as a, as a do-gooder, I'm remembering one incident when during that community, uh, when while working there, there was a huge flood that came. And uh, in this community, people are living in little huts. And so we had to help like, you know, sort of find them a different way to like pull them out from the water and all their sort of, uh, you know, things were getting destroyed. And one of the problems in that slum was that there weren't toilets because uh, people had just migrated and they'd been living there for years, but there was no money to make toilets. So a lot of people would uh, go out in the open. Uh, for, for, uh, as, and, and so here I am walking in that sludge of human excreta and doing that work. And at some point I go home and I clean up and I'm supposed to go to an event uh, where there are some fairly privileged people in that event. And I'm so stuck into the grief and the anger of what I had just experienced that I'm so, I don't think there was anything wrong in experiencing the grief and anger, uh, but to be stuck in it, that I remember being completely incapable of engaging with that community. And so I can see my own forms of continuous like othering, which is really a, a sort of a patriarchal paradigm because we can explain or define patriarchy at least as a working definition as a system of dominance and control and othering and separation. And so in any of this work that we are doing, like are, what, what am I becoming myself? Because I found myself in a lot of these situations as an activist or a do-gooder or any of these things, either I'm becoming dry, hard, and shrill, or I'm, uh, I'm not able to, like my own attempts to respond are replicating the very system that I'm trying to change. And I'm not seeing the powerful results because I'm wondering if I do this long enough, it will change. And this has to do with a certain amount of uh, fragmentation of our own lives that is showing up, that is sort of uh, leaking into all our work. So what I'm trying to say here is being an activist, being a do-gooder, being all of these things, which I really respect and they need to be done, but to also understand that they are only and only the step one. There's a lot more work to be done, uh, which is going to really demand us to go into the underworld of our own hearts, of our own minds and look at the shadows that we are not deeply engaging with. And so beauty is not available without entering the depths of the underworld and allowing the, uh, the old and stuck energy to get disrupted. Entering the dark night of the soul with no guarantee that you will come out. It will, and it will bring about an identity crisis. And it is a necessary crisis to grapple with in order to really come out. So at this point, the last thing I wanna share is this teachings of the Navarasas, 
rasas are you can think of them as juices or sap nava means nine and some of the nine rasas that are, are, are offered in some of these tantric teachings are the rasa of Shringar, which is which, which kind of be, can be translated into love, attraction, beauty. Uh, there's the rasa of joy, the rasa of anger, outrage, fury, the rasa of grief, compassion, mercy. There's a rasa of disgust fear, terror, and the rasa of heroism or courage. Another is this rasa of wonder, amazement, or curiosity. And the ninth rasa is shantam, which is peace, but it is not some kind of a dry, barren peace that kills all the nine rasas. It's a very pregnant peace. It's a very radiant, luminous form of kind of peace. It's a very full and rich form of peace. And so the, the invitation is to cultivate the capacity to touch into the rasa at its required intensity, but not get stuck in any of it. For example, I meet certain activists who are so much in the anger and the outrage. And I am so grateful that they are because it is so necessary. However, at some point, I, 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 I have to tell them like, it's okay to put down your weapons and you can rest and you can enjoy a different rasa. It's okay to do that because the problem is not with any of these rasas. In fact, you're invited to deeply enter to the full intensity or intensity of the rasa that it demands, but not to get stuck in either of them. With grief too. And so I find myself going also into communities where uh, some activist spaces where there is a lot of understanding and capacity to enter grief or anger, or heroism, courage. But the other rasas are completely or largely missing. Like there isn't a capacity to really feel into the, the love or the romance or the attraction or the passion for life, the joy, the mirth, like some of those things are deeply missing. And so that's what we are talking about, the paradox is to have the expansiveness of our consciousness to really hold these paradoxes. And the depths at which you can engage these shadows is the depths at which you can move in and out of these aspects or archetypes. And so when, and I'm not trying to say I'm, I, com I completely uh, have uh, achieved this, this the, the potentiality of this, but my aspiration is very strong. And in my own life, I have experienced the power of what is possible and the coherence that comes from this. And my, my understanding is that if we can really uh, cultivate ourselves in such a big and expansive way, we will know how to respond to a moment and our responses will not be formulaic. So there might be a moment when it invites us to really step on to the front lines of activism and there might be another moment that maybe what we really need to do is to meditate and there might be a moment when what we really need to do is make love. And so that, that deeper inner shadow work will help us actually see this. So these rasas are able to give us these archetypes that we can easily enter and fully embody. So I feel as a real activist who wants to create the level of transformation that we desire, like can we 
know how to be in all of these archetypes and how to shape shift, how to, how to move through these different archetypes uh, as needed. And so our response to the moment like fully meets what the moment demands. So I'm gonna stop here. And uh, before we go into q and I'm gonna invite you all to do something very simple. Uh, just reflect that in your own life, out of these nine rasas, which one are you able to, which ones like come very easily to you and which ones you are not in touch with. And also see like to what degree are you able to fully enter and come out of these different uh, rasas or juices of life. So I'm going to pull up my screen. And so take a couple of minutes to just reflect on your own life. And then we will put you in breakout rooms. And I'll just invite each person to share a little bit. Uh, and you are in choice. So if you don't want to share, that's okay. But if you feel like sharing with others, just share like what is your relationship with these different energies because the rasas are energies and a lot of times when we have not fully delved and experienced them deep enough they remain distorted and when we are distorted we are kind of walking like this or like this into the world like we are not whole and so you can share uh, what is your relationship with these nine rasas and which ones comes very easily and fully to you and which ones you don't have a relationship with. So hopefully that's clear and I'll keep this list on your screen so you can see it easily. So Astrid, feel free to put people into breakout rooms of three. And we'll do this for about eight minutes. Welcome back. So I want to open this up for question answers. It's completely weird to be talking into a screen for all this while. <laughs> so I, I would love to hear your voices. And uh, any thoughts, any reflections, any questions? Um, yeah, feel free. And if you end up typing your questions in the chat, that's also okay and Astrid can read them out. And also as you're, as we're waiting for people to write uh, questions in the chat, um, I just want to copy paste a form into the chat for you to stay in touch with Nirali. Nirali, is that okay for me to do that now? Yes, please, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you want to stay in touch with Nirali, because there is a lot to un unpack from her talk, you can sign up on the form that I'm um, sending into the chat right now. And you can do that as we're um, entering Q&A. Yeah. I also want to clarify that what I shared with the rasa and the archetypes is truly just one modality. Like I'm not claiming exclusivity to that being any way but it sort of gives us something to work around. Um, because oftentimes we, we are stuck in a, we are caught up in a binary. We feel like either I am uh, sort of in uh, contracting or retracting in hyper individualism and spiritual bypassing and emotional bypassing and narcissism and self-obsession, either I'm in that club or I'm an activist in the front lines, putting my bodies on the line, which I do recommend, but that's the second option. What I'm suggesting is that there is also a third option when you pull to these options together and yoke it into a third option. And, and from this place, there will be a spontaneous response that will come forth. It may not be a formulaic response. It might mean that you will go to the front lines and give your blood for the revolution. It might mean you might uh, sit in a cave and look at your mind and see how your mind is, uh, is really 
participating in the world and how as some teachers would say the world is me and I am the world and so how how it's reflecting and co-creating the world uh, or you might say well my most authentic response of this moment is to go and make love to my partner or to the politician I don't know <laughs> So maybe that's your response. And that's what I'm trying to say is it won't be a formulaic response because it is not coming from that level of emotional and spiritual bypassing because you're not acting out from fear, greed, and shame. So at that note, if there are any questions, I would love to hear. Yeah, we have a question over here. How do we practice fluidity between these rasas? How do I figure out my role in the revolution? I feel from my experience of doing this practice is to cultivate the capacity to begin to enter each of these rasas as fully as, as I'm capable of. And having enough experience with each of them, I begin to also notice like, am I getting stuck in it? You know, for example, grief is so important and necessary, especially when we are faced with the suffering in our world. But if I'm just stuck in grief, I'm not helpful. So how do I come out and also be able to move into different spectrums of my life? So it's really practice and it's, it will be, it's in my experience, it is the most demanding work I have done. I have faced off cops and I have been arrested and I, I've like gone through a lot of difficult things that might look difficult on the surface, but the, but doing this internal work has really disrupted me in places that, uh, that, that I did not even imagine. It has created many levels of identity crisis, <laughs> which has, uh, I think, eventually been helpful. Thank you, Nirali. Another question uh, from Sonali. What does fragmentation in the modern life look like? How do we move into coherence? I'm not sure if I really get that because I feel like it's, at least for me in my own life, the fragmentation feels very real <laughs> and obvious. Uh, and I don't necessarily feel that, I, I feel definitely glimpses of that wholeness of beauty, of coherence. And that gives me a lot of confidence and impetus, uh, aspiration to keep wanting to move into it. But rest of the time, there's a lot of fragmentation. <laughs> Thank you. Our third question from Manzi. Um, so these rasas are the energies that we need. Oh, and your question just came. So these rasas are the energies that we need to harmonize in our activism. Yes, tracking where we're stuck or drawn or resistant to is the vector for finding our path forward or next step in activism. Beautiful. Yes, Mansi, that's beautifully articulated, better than I could. So thank you. Thanks. Another question from Carol. Um, I think we in my breakout room rejected or felt very tentative about the trickster. How do you embrace something we have been told is wrong? That's a very good question. Thank you for sharing that. So each of these archetypes uh, have a liberated quality and a shadow quality. So a lot of, maybe, maybe you're aware of the shadow quality of a trickster, but there can be a, the trickster which is, who's playful, you know, who's sort of weird. If I do something like a funny face right now, that would be a trickster in a way. You know, I'm kind of sort of jarring you, breaking a certain pattern. Uh, into into sort of the stream, the normal pattern stream of consciousness. So that would, and, and I think there is a beautiful role of a trickster, a fool, a disruptor. Uh, but 
definitely each of these archetypes have a, a liberated quality and an encumbered uh, shadow quality and we have to sort of purify transform and release that shadow quality thanks Mirai. we have a lot of questions coming in here um let's see uh question from verana how does the weird enter into these spaces and how does it contribute to beauty and coherence the weird is extraordinarily important and the weird is beauty, at least in the way I'm talking about it, because, uh, and I, I'm not sure, Virana, how you mean the word weird, but when I think of strangeness or weirdness, uh, it is an invitation into the unfamiliar and into the unknown and sometimes the otherworldly. And that's again a necessary force for me to engage with because it, it does something very similar to what something so-called beautiful does. You know, it stuns me. It might, you know, sort of shock me, open me into delight or awe or curiosity. So we need more weirdness, strangeness in our world. <laughs> Thanks. Another question from Megan. Um, fragmentation, aka trauma, is a legacy of colonialism? Question mark. Would you repeat that, please? So it's it's a. Uh, I guess the full question the full question would be: Is fragmentation, aka trauma, a legacy of colonialism? If I understand well, Megan, please unmute yourself. If I over. Yes, yeah, if you want to have a follow up to this, but uh, in my understanding, not all trauma and not all fragmentation is uh, a legacy of colonialism, but definitely some of it is. So I was born and raised in India, and we have our own problems too, uh, and our own intergenerational trauma that comes from patriarchy and many other places. So, and definitely colonialism added a lot of work to that. So it's, it's definitely been difficult and painful to have had to work through the overcoupling of already some of our own intergenerational trauma from many other places that was flowing in the stream and overcoupled with the enormous, brutal trauma of colonialism. Thanks, Nirali. And maybe last question, because we're coming to the end of our time together. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, please go ahead. And I would love to hear some voices too, if it's possible. So maybe you can ask that question and we can try to save time for that. Yeah, okay. Um, perhaps we can use the last five minutes um, as you want. Last five minutes are yours. Okay, so last question, uh, at least in this format um, from Pat. So perhaps we should be disrupting the kind of frozen pattern of demonstrations and police response with acts of beauty, question mark. Yeah, I feel what is already happening is pretty amazing and I'm deeply moved by what's happening. And there's definitely opportunity for more. Uh, and in order for this to be sustainable, there is opportunity for more because I cannot separate, as Dr. King would have say, uh, has said, like I cannot separate the oppression and atrocities on the black community from economic violence. And until we really look at the connection to, to that and really work, like it would be, it is great to see some of the changes that are happening, but that that really doesn't meet the need of the moment until we look at the extraordinary violence that the black community faces because of economic inequity and capitalism. And so in order to continue this work, 
and I don't think this work is going to be one more week or three more weeks. It's long term work. We will need to bring in these other forces that I'm speaking to in this talk. So, and, and so that it is sustainable also for us as activists and we don't get burnt out. Thank you, Mirai. Thank you so much. Um, to everyone who still has questions, if you want, you can feel free to email them over here. And perhaps we'll send them to Mirai. And yeah, I would love to hear your reflections, thoughts, uh, disagreements. Yeah, exactly. So I'm, I'm pasting again the link. So for those of you whose questions have not been answered, feel free to, I, I see a question from Manzi. Can you please also paste the link to donate? Yes, Chris, would you be able to do that? Uh, yeah, there's a lot to unpack here. And so we are also letting, uh, I'm also offering this link here so that I don't know if this turns into a four week program, uh, which I've been asked to consider creating a four week sort of an intensive on this topic and really going into the depths of it. and. And so if that happens or something else happens, uh, if you fill this form, you can stay in touch. Yeah, thank you. I'm so grateful, Nirali. From the day I met you, I've been inspired every single time I've heard you speak. Um, yeah, thank, thank you so much. much. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you're willing, it'd be nice if there anyone wants, I don't know how do they face their hand or how do they speak? Maybe they say something in chat if they want to speak. Yeah. Yeah, so what we can do, it's 5.59. So if uh, some people have to leave, feel free to leave. And yeah, feel free if people want to leave, for sure. Yeah, and but otherwise, what we can do is use the raise hand button. Or you can just um, put in the chat a little comment that you would like to unmute yourself and speak. And I have it set so folks should be able to unmute themselves at this point. So Nirali, if you wanted to call on people. Okay. I also want to just mention that for those who do need to leave that a follow up email will be sent um, with the information about how to find the video when it's been edited and posted on our YouTube channel. And also with the information about how to donate in support of East Point and to sustain Nirali's work as well. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. It's really a joy to share this space with you. Yes, I don't, one, one, six, nine, zero. You can unmute. Um, yes, thank you. This was, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no. Uh, go ahead. One, one, one. Okay, thank you. Um, my question had to do the patriarchy in say, our, for example, our religion, I'm Catholic. And it's just so hard because like we respect our priests. You know, so many are like, are so good, you know, just the top of everything. But yet, how do we you know, how do I deny or someone, you know, young woman deny that they had that calling, you know, they felt that calling and how to bring it up. Uh, I know we could pray about it. We pray about it a lot, but I just feel blessed to, uh, uh, to hear your thoughts on, you know, and maybe others have some input on that question. Thank you. Thank you. Your question is really important. And I feel it's a huge question that you're asking. There's no way I can do justice to what you're um, calling in right now, but I do know that how do we keep finding skillful, nonviolent, somewhat nonviolent ways, as much as nonviolent ways to, to really change these paradigms because they appear to be working, but they're actually doing a lot of harm. Like I, I kind of, in some form, like may, maybe identify as a dharma teacher, a meditation teacher. 
and I know the level of spiritual bypassing that I have done in my own life and how that has harmed others. And that is a patriarchal recapitulation. And, and also like being able to have thoughtful conversations with people and, and creating a community within your group also so that you have allies, you have an affinity group so that you mm -hmm. can talk about it with each other and then find a way to do this as skillfully as possible so that your intent is not to shame or blame or to destroy anyone uh, or to seek revenge, any of those things, but your aim is to actually bring about the transformation, the coherence, the beauty that is possible in your church. Thank you. Thank you. If folks have to leave, I really respect that and please do. And for me, I'm just feeling very nice to hear your voices. So I'm just taking a few more minutes here. Yeah, actually we have Daniel. Daniel, if you want to unmute yourself. Um, hi. Hi. Uh, we, uh, I had the pleasure of uh, being a part of uh, a fierce vulnerability workshop with you, um, so it's great to be nice with you again. Hi, <laughs> um, yeah, just so I'm just feeling so moved and uh, and and so grateful, and just wanting to express that. And also, um, I guess, just wanting to really express like. Uh, a sense of the way that that I feel torn between the communities I'm a part of right now, um, and the way that that sort of tornness is 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 leading to to deeper levels of my own inquiry and my own uh, deconstruction of 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 whiteness and maleness and and. Um, and so I guess I'm going to read because it feels easier right now. What I wrote was, was just that like, th th there's this sense of like, don't like, you don't, you don't, like, you don't get to go inside and feel your own sense of beauty. When people are dying, your job is to get out there and get in between those bodies to stop the harm. Yes. And, and I, I feel the ways in which my own system, being able to sort of put my head down on my pillow and sort of oh, feel into like spiritually, like the, the oneness of humanity. Like, like I, I feel the inherent privilege in, in the sort of stance on nonviolence that I, that, that, that I, I, I resonate with. And so, and so I, I guess I just felt like it was just, I just wanted to sort of bring forward and just really hear, I'm so grateful for, for, for what, you, what you bring. And, and there's just something around like white folks being able to take talks like this as excuses for an action. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and being able to use a sense of like, see all the anger and the rage is sort of misguided. Really, we should be feeling our own feelings. Like, and, 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 I, and I, I hear the, the beauty and the power in the sort of feminist intervention of what you're bringing, that softness is not that. Softness is not inaction. Feminism is not uh, uh, passivity. Like, like and, I, and I just, I just guess like, I felt like, like just naming what it is that I myself am sort of in the midst of as a white man in this world in, in sort of in, in, in trying to navigate what it is about my own privilege I need to be deconstructing around an action while also not like, like that, that there's this sometimes this sense of destruction breeding destruction breeding destruction and if you want to if you want to stand for equality you must also destroy yourself 
there's something in that. It, it's all really messy, but I, I just I just wanted to yeah, know. Yeah, so you're bringing in a couple of very important things here. First of all, I'm I'm glad to see you being churned in this. This is necessary to feel this churned in. This is like a necessary disruption that that needs to be happen and it will be messy which means that you will put your body on the line and you will also be in this inquiry simultaneously you know it's not an either or because as i said we keep getting caught in the binary and that in, in the answer is not in the average of the binary there's a third way is what I'm trying to propose. And that third way is not available without this churn. So I'm grateful because the question around privilege is a disturbing one. The question around spiritual bypassing, using these as tricks to sort of escape and sort of retract back in my individualism is a, is a real one. And what I'm proposing is to let ourselves really be churned in them. Even in the last three days, as I'm like thinking through this talk, I, am, I have shed tears of the ways in which I am churning in this. And at the same time, I know that without the discernment, just doing things and becoming some sort of a doer that is stuck because I have experienced my, in my own life becoming dry and brittle and sharp edged and uh, heavy as if I'm always holding the weight of everything. And I begin to wonder like, is this the world that I want to embody? If I want to embody a certain kind of world, I have to be that world now. You know, if I want to embody a world which is beautiful, I have to be, have a relationship with beauty now, right? So, and that's how we will get to that. So, but, but this process is not an either or, it is, and it's a, dialogically speaking, it's a very difficult process to even talk about because it's a slippery slope all the way. And I would really invite you, request you to don't stop churning, to not stop this churning. Keep going, keep going. There's something here that is necessary and I'm grateful that you're doing this. I'd like to make a comment if that's okay. Um, yes, um, Daniel, first of all, um, thank you so much for, for your passion and, um, and, and for your, the, the heartfelt desires that I hear in your voice of, of making the world a better place after 50 years of, of being an activist and protesting and, uh, some of us, we get tired, you know, and, and, and it is, it is a breath of life and a breath of fresh air to hear younger people stepping up and, and filling in when we have to step back. And Nirali, I'll tell you, this was exactly what I needed to hear. Excuse my emotion, but I have fought hard over the past few weeks to figure out where do I fit in activism when I can't be out there all the time, when I don't have the physical stamina that I used to have. And, and it can be heartbreaking, especially when it has become so much more personal with mixed race grandbabies that I am fighting for to have you pull things that I've been on this intuitive journey for the past three months 
that I have been diving deep into and your everything that you said was like you went out and you pulled all of the pieces that have been coming together and just tied them up in a nice neat little bow for me and made it real and tangible and something that I can do. I already know how to do this. I already know what to do, but you gave a purpose to it in a way that I had not thought of. So thank you so much for that shift. And um, hopefully by sharing this, maybe it helps somebody else make that shift too. But thank you, I appreciate you. Thank you so much, Donna, for saying this. Really appreciate your comment. And yeah, I, I feel it's about the paradox and subsuming the paradox and doing both and being in the churn to find the third way. Um, I would love to hear if there's a person of color or someone who wants to take, a, take up a space <laughs> and take up a couple more minutes. Uh, we'll close in about three minutes. Uh, so if there's anyone who wants to say anything, uh, you're welcome to. Uh, if I may, I could share a, a dream that I think fits into this, a wonderful dream I had in, the, in this journey of being eaten alive by rats, a terrifying dream. But, but when I looked down and I saw the baby rats in the nest, something transformed. There was something about, oh, and life will go on. Uh, transformations will continue. I'm much older, and and it's it was a really powerful dream to go from terror to that. I it just seemed you were talking about the shadow and deep diving, and I it was very very powerful. Yeah, rats definitely show up in the underworld. <laughs> Thank you. All right, everyone. I really wish you all a lot of. Um, support as you keep doing this work and lots of goodwill lots of blessings and may we keep doing this difficult work with nourishment with support and don't stop so wishing all of us to show up for the world fully awake in the fullness of our power, our coherence, our beauty, and our love for this precious, precious planet. So thank you. And once again, thank you, Astrid, Chris, Kazu. I'll end here. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. If you want to unmute yourself and say thank you, go ahead. Oh, yes, please. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Narali. If you want to support us, you can go to our website and uh, the uh, go to Narali donate so to this link. There are problems though right now with the website. So if you can go to PayPal or Facebook, that would actually be easier and make a note as you donate that this is for Neurali stock. Um, yeah, and if you encounter any problem, please email us also.